Good afternoon, guys and gals. Welcome back to theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We are covering day two of HPE Discover from Las Vegas, toasty Las Vegas. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante. Dave, some of the big news yesterday was all about GreenLake. GreenLake for LLMs is a big topic. HPE is pioneering that with a partner that we get to talk to next. Yeah, well, of course, the AI heard around the world, as we like to say sometimes, has changed everybody's thinking on this. And yeah. so, you know, HP, rightly, is leaning in, so. They are absolutely leaning in. We've got one of our al alumni back, Dr. Ang Lim Go. Great to see you, SVP and Chief Technology Officer at AI for HPE. And Jonas Andrulis, CEO of Aleph Alpha, joins us. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Hello. Thanks for having you us. must be Speaking. so popular since the announcement came out yesterday. <laughs> Jonas, talk to us a little bit about Aleph Alpha, founded in 2019, but yeah. I understand this is your third AI startup. Talk to us about that and how you're working together to really pioneer what HPE is going to deliver. Yeah, um, so yeah, we started this in 19. This was even before GPT-3 was out. And so we were building language models back then, starting to do that. Of course, the sizes have changed. Mm. Like scale has kind of massively driven a big part of this innovation, but we, driv we drove a significant part of the innovation in that field. Like we invented multimodality, we open source that, so that was kind of came, coming out of our lab first. And we now have basically built something for explainability that can give you for every claim that you're outputting that these models are basically mm. creating can give you like a positive and a negative trace. So you can not just have it like in some link and some URL, but you can actually look at and drill into documents and sources of and evidence on how to confirm or contradict certain claims. And we found that this is really what is required for, for humans to take responsibility. Yeah. So when people talk about guardrails, yeah. right? That, this is what they're talking about, right? Is yeah. it's specifically designed for things like explainability, yeah. or maybe to ask more questions if the AI doesn't know the answer. Is that? Or, or if you mix things up sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be uh, reassured that uh, it is not doing that. Yeah. yeah. So that and that's so that's the intent. Is you know, if you talk about hallucinations, it's yeah. to minimize that. Well, right? so yes, hallucinations, but also when you look at the kind of most valuable uh, use cases, those are never as simple as right or wrong. Like when you think about lawyers or medical professionals, it's not like they're asking a question and then you could say the answer is clearly wrong or right, right? This is maybe if you're writing your homework with like some chatbot, but if you're trying to figure out how to, how to orchestrate different perspectives, how to align this with strategy, how to take responsibility, you need something else than just a chatbot that gives you a reply that's either wrong or right. Mm. So that was what we're focusing. We're focusing on these highly regulated industries, really complex workloads that rely on proprietary data, and we want to make this as sovereign uh, as possible. Mm. Dr. Go, talk a little bit about why Aleph Alpha was chosen as the pioneer for this groundbreaking news from HPE. What was it about the technology, the minds behind it, that HPE decided this is the right way to launch this? No, oh, it's a great question. You know. And uh, it goes way back, you know, I mean, in, even in September of last year, I was already engaging, way, way even before some of the other chatbots uh, came to the market, right? I was already working uh, on their models, and even way back then, their models were already accepting images. Mm. Yeah, uh, and so, very advanced, yeah. And the fact that uh, there is uh, ability to uh, deal with highly regulated industry, right? explainability yeah. was important. I mean, if you finance, healthcare, yeah. Yeah. all these are required, uh, uh, have strong regulatory requirements. Yeah. And, and then what we do in addition to that is to build tools uh, in front of it that Aleph Alpha is using, especially in the regulated industry. For example, when uh, a regulator comes in and asks for an audit, right? Um, uh, Aleph Alpha has explainability. But sometimes they also want to ask, what data do you feed that model with? Because that can influence the model. So we, we've actually acquired uh, tools like Pachyderm, that is we, we've renamed uh, an HPE product, that will keep track of the, uh, keeps a database of what you've trained the model with so that uh, during an audit, right? And, and you are, in fact, you are using Pachyderm too. Uh, yeah, for that. yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, our part of the coin, like why, do, why is the partnership great for us? Mm -hmm. right? Because we've, it's, an, it's an ecosystem that, that we're fitting in. It's not just kind of metal, it's also that. It's also like 
great hardware that we're running on, but it's also basically the whole ecosystem with data governance, with uh, MLDE that we're using for, to run our experiments and the kind of research. So I think for, for us it's really, it's a great fit because we align very well with our values, what we want to bring to the customer. Like, both companies are very much focused on bringing engineering excellence in like a sovereign way to the customer. So I think that's, that's uh, mm. from our side why I'm really excited about the partnership. And I must say, uh, Pachyderm has now been renamed an HPE product called uh, Machine Learning Data Management System, right? Uh, to, to work complementary to the R model. And, and uh, you know, it is very different uh, when we build a cloud service for a uh, large language model. It's very different, right? The, the traditional cloud service model is where you have many, many workloads running on many compute servers. But with a large language model, you have one workload running on many compute servers. And therefore, the scalability part is very different. This is where we bring in our supercomputing knowledge that we have for decades to be able to deal with this one big workload on many compute servers. So as a developer, you had to think about that and program to what Dr. Go just described, I presume, right? And that, was that part of the breakthroughs that, that you made in the last several years? Or? Yeah, so Taking advantage of that architecture? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we built something that is on the research side and on the engineering side. It's quite unique and fits well into these ecosystems. Uh, and it allows uh, customers, for example, to choose different execution environments. So let's say you, you're in a highly regulated like, industry, very compliant data, and you have certain workloads that you want to never leave your premises. But you've got others, like customer support, that you want to run on, on GreenLake. Right? So you can, you can do this, you can combine this all with our different sizes of our models, different customizations, and you can choose execution environments, and it all kind of fits well together. So I think, yeah, we're definitely thinking about this, and our approach, like the way I think about it, is not just, hey, those guys trained one of the best LLMs and it's also multimodal, but I think about how can we bring the, the power of this technology to world's best enterprises in, in the, like the best way to support them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the partnership obviously yeah. comes yes, in. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the analysts were all in sort of curious as to why HPE would choose uh, just a small startup, uh, why, why, why? And yeah. I'm not surprised at all, I'm actually happy because that's where all the innovation happens. I say, it's about time, it's good. Yeah. You know, they, are, uh, they are leader in innovation, yeah. right? And uh, they are focused on the industry that uh, is regulated explainability, all these are key factors for many of our customers. Yeah. So, Enterprise customers. Uh, yeah. uh, when, when we have, I know there's a lot of other questions we want to get to, like the AI ethics website and governance website, but before we do it, when we have an AI expert or two AI experts on, we'd like to ask them, sort of take us back to, I mean, even mid last decade, uh, this stuff was not, the breakthroughs weren't there. Yeah. And then it seems like scale became you know, better understood. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned vision as well, and images. How important were those? I, I, help us understand those, those breakthroughs that you were able to make as, as researchers and, and, and as an industry. Mm -hmm. so, uh, go ahead. I, I have to start. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so what kind of drove this innovation from, from my perspective is the realization that by building on language, we're not just building, we're not just kind of learning speech patterns and grammar, but we're actually learning the result of human intelligence. And so in language, in like a more complex, when you look at different levels of abstraction, of complexity, how you want to model language, and of course the simplest level is things like good morning, right? Or, so, or once upon a time, right? That's easy. Yeah. But then if you look at, and, and if you make these models bigger and bigger, they get deeper and deeper. And so they're, they're able to understand a conceptual structure in that data, and this seems to carry some of the, the results of our intelligence. So I think mm. this is one of That's the key drivers. So, so I'm interested interesting. in how important yeah. scale was yeah, yeah. Uh, in that regard, and also vision. Was, was vision more important than, uh, yeah. than how, well, what, what impact did yeah. that have? Well, uh, I, I, uh, I came from Silicon Graphics, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Vision, right? Mm -hmm. And HP acquired Silicon Graphics and I came with it. And back then, in 96, uh, we actually started working on neural networks. It's just that we didn't have the scale of compute uh, power to deal with it and the ability to get all this data into it. 
So then uh, I, I kept quiet about AI uh, until recently. Right? <laughs> so 26 years ago, we were working on this, right? So it is the scale that made the difference. I like to always say, you know, we humans uh, probably would have come across uh, 1,000 book equivalents, you know, equivalent of 1,000 books of text in our lifetime. Mm. Uh, a, a neural network model like this, a large language model, you know, uh, probably 10 million books equivalent. So, so, so these things have seen so many word connections, right? Yeah? In, in, in terms of word vectors and embeddings, so many different word connections that when you are conversing with it, it may come up with string of words that uh, you have never come across before because it has seen 10 million while you've only seen 1,000 yeah. books, you see? Yeah. So that's the key, the scale key. The only problem with that is that even though he has come across 10 million books, he has not gone through the meaning of each word like a dictionary. No. He has only seen words in relationship with other words, yeah? Right? While we humans uh, go through the dictionary. That's the part of the reason why once in a while it makes things up. That's the reason why we need uh, Jonas's model. Yeah. And, and, and how important was the ability to ingest images and analyze oh. images in terms of, like for instance, was, was that more important than speech? It, it started out with, uh, with images. I mean, yeah. uh, in the recent uh, convolution neural networks, mm -hmm. before uh, we call all these large language models, there were more narrow type uh, neural networks called CNNs, convolution neural networks, and they were built to deal with images. And in fact, uh, the worldwide competition then was to see who can uh, recognize images best. Yeah? There was a huge competition ongoing, and they kept reducing the error rates until it was uh, better than human recognition of images. Yeah? And was that a major breakthrough in terms yeah. of the accuracy and the validity of the models? So what I like, and like my last startup was, was doing a lot in vision. Um, what I like about today's vision and multimodality is that we're not limiting our understanding of, of visual or multimodal data to predefined classes. So like a few years ago, we were looking for pedestrians or cells. Cats, cats, cats or yeah, cats and pictures. Cats, exactly, right? <laughs> so we had a, a very predefined set of things we were looking for and then we were training these AI systems to perform well for these objects. Um, and that's fine and all if you just want to do like a self-driving car that's not going to run into pedestrians. But even with self-driving cars, we found that this covers 99% of all the observations, but the 1%, those are things that we cannot easily put into like rules. And now we found a way to combine the continuous space of images with the symbolic space that, that has reasoning capabilities or at least the reasoning capability of a stochastic parrot. And now we are able to combine these two worlds in like one embedding. And that there's kind of recent work yeah. from our team that shows that our model is multilingual and multi multimodal, and it has a shared embedding. So if you basically express the same thing in different languages, and you express it in words or in images, you're getting actually like a very similar understanding of the AI system. So the fusion of the vision and the textual, right? Yeah. In integrating the two together actually is uh, the big breakthrough. Yeah. Do you consider it a learning system? The critics of today's AI and generative AI say, well, they're not learning systems. Um, they're basically a database with search and some natural language processing. I, I, not my words, but this is what some of the critics say. But it feels like it's much more than that. It's you consider it a learning system. Yes, it's, it's a lot more, it's yeah. a lot more. And in, in fact, uh, what it does actually is, right, it, you have a, a network with uh, lots of connections, and then you start feeding it with uh, tons and tons of text in a string. And all it does is uh, watching for each word, right, how uh, often are the other words occurring in that string. So it builds a network of the how Say for example, uh, the, between the word deer and bear, right, seems to make a strong connection because every time the word deer occurs, uh, bear also occurs nearby. But uh, deer with turnip probably occurs less, so the connection is weaker. That's how they build it. 50,000 words, right? Uh, it builds the connection with all the other 50,000 words, yeah. And this is how it becomes, uh, uh, have the ability to predict that next word. Yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. So yeah. the scale is massive and one of the things that I, 
we talked with Antonio Neri about this morning and we, we heard about it yesterday and we talk about this all the time is sustainability, sustainable AI. Can you talk about what HPE is doing from a GreenLink perspective with LF Alpha that is enabling organizations to harness the power mm -hmm. of these LLMs in a sustainable way so that they can really yeah. meet their objectives? Yeah, this is, this is a huge question, right? Given the ESG requirements yeah. and the science-based uh, targets that many of these companies have today, yeah. Right, um, and, and the, these models are huge, right? Uh, uh, some models are 100 billion connections, some models are trillion connections. Every time it, it reads a word or comes up with a word, a trillion connections get fired up, right? That's consuming a lot of energy. So that's part of the reason why we on the HPE side uh, have two things, right? One, we build systems that are the most energy efficient we can make them, right? And we, we have that heritage from the supercomputing world. Right, so build highly energy efficient system. Right, imagine if a if a big system is 20 megawatts, 10% efficiency wasted is two megawatts of power wasted. Right, so all these years or decades we've been working on energy efficient hardware systems. Right, number one, and number two, to also build like in the um, HPE GreenLake layer uh, a sustainability dashboard, so you can track as you are running the model efficiently. Right, to also know. What, how much you are consuming. So perhaps as you are tuning your model, you also watch uh, how best to tune it for efficiency too. Right. Right. So, and also all the software layers before, uh, below that. So efficiency is a big ticket item. That's, that's why when we announced HPE GreenLake for large language models, you know, efficiency, energy efficiency is a big factor. Uh, productivity uh, and also efficiency of splitting that big workload across many servers. Yeah. Last question, guys, as we're running out of time here. I would love to know just some of the feedback that you've gotten in the last, what, 24 hours, 26 hours since the announcement came out. What's the, what are some of those highly regulated customers, industry customers coming to you with, with comments, questions? How can I get started? Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, they, are, they are, in general, just two different groups of customers, right? Uh, and in highly regulated industries like finance and healthcare, uh, there is a group that are uh, advanced, right? They already uh, have investigated this. They may have a small group of data scientists of their own, done some investigation, and uh, they are ready to go. But they realize that when they deploy this at scale, they don't want to deal with all the complexities, right? Energy efficiency, getting the systems together, put all those tools together. And even if, you are, if they did that, then how to run it operationally at scale, mm -hmm. right? So this is where uh, we have that discussion, HP GreenLake for large language models, for example, or HP GreenLake for AI. But then there is also another group of customers, they are very early, right? They have a desire and they believe that this is the right thing to do. They have to be competitive and they need to do this, right? To build an AI model for their specific purposes uh, and, and be accepted by the regulated industry, uh, regulators. And, and this is where we come in uh, to go along with them on their journey. Yeah. And it, uh, separate, different from the other one where they are ready to deploy. Right here, uh, we start early with them and work with them and go along with them on their journey towards production. Mm. Sounds so, like, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, so that, that means that you've got an, an, an AI system that is a trusted partner, if you will. Yeah. Right, that, that, yeah, that's really <laughs> what you're delivering within these highly regulated industries. Yeah. It, yes. And that's, that's what people really want, right? Because it's fun when it's making stuff up, but you can't trust it. Yes, for the consumer is one thing, but for enterprises, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's a different thing. No, yeah. no exactly, yeah. and it's already integrated. Right? So it, it's more than just like creating some text. You need auditability, you need access control, identity management, right? You need to make sure that only the information that you want a certain user to have access to is being used. You need to make sure that the results are reproducible, that you can always go back and look at why was this the result? Why maybe it was based on some like outdated data that was still in, in the knowledge base, right? But you need, to, you need to make this transparent and accessible. And I think this is really where we have a strong advantage, where we can kind of combine everything into like a scalable, turnkey ready solution. And to, to your point, like the second part of customers, they understand that strategically this matters. It's about their sovereignty, it's about their value capture a few years down the line, but they're struggling with 
the limited resources and what to focus on now. Like, what is the thing that, because this technology can do almost everything. Like we have customers yeah. that are building business processes, accessing databases with that. You can do so much. And then for a, like a single enterprise, the, the question is, what is the thing we need to do right now and what is the thing we need to kind of get on its way so we can do it next year and then year after. And build a and roadmap. And there's the journey. Yeah. Yes. There's journey. the journey yes, and exactly. it sounds like they've got great, the customers in every industry have great partners and in HPE, what you're doing with Greenleaf, what you announced with Aleph Alpha. Guys, this is so exciting. I, I, we could spend way much more time. I think we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. This is fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. Congratulations. And the yeah, partnership. So, thanks yes. a lot. On Thank the cube. Thanks. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right. You heard it here. You're going to yeah. be checking out Aleph Alpha. I know it. We want to thank you so much for our guests and for Dave Vellante. I'm Lisa Martin. Stick around. Great cube content coming up next.